Okay, so we'll get started, and uh, you should have all received an announce uh, an email now about the cores. So we have three uh, oncology branches where you can go see the uh, case reports, and we also have three core labs that you can visit. So you're supposed to sign up for that and return the email to me. And um, our second speaker today is Yves Pommier. He's going to be talking about chemotherapeutic drugs, especially topoisomerase inhibitors. And our first speaker is Frank Maldorelli. He's uh, got his PhD from City University of New York, an MD from Mount Sinai School of Medicine. And he completed a residency at Columbia Presbyterian Hospital. He then joined the NIH first at NIAID as a medical staff fellow, and then we recruited him to NCI, and he's been here since 1998. He's head of the DRP host virus interaction branch, and his title today is Retroviruses, right? Thanks a lot. Thanks very much, Terry, for, for having me and for having this course, um, and for having a lecture on retroviruses. So um, I realize that uh, m most of us are with the NCI, but I, I think one of the points I wanted to make today is that uh, retroviruses have been uh, part of our history long before uh, uh, HIV or some of the or the known human retroviruses. So it's a big, uh, it's always been uh, a big deal at NCI. And what I'd like to uh, really do today is uh, uh, five points, just to introduce the topic, discuss really the, the nuts and bolts, the molecular biology of the virus and how it replicates, what it's like in human populations, how it emerged and how it spread, and then perhaps some lessons that, uh, uh, that those data may, uh, 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 may offer us. So um, let's start out with the other virus, just uh, for fun that uh, there are really two large groups of viruses infecting humans that are retroviruses, and one of them uh, is the human T-cell leukemia virus. And this, uh, just uh, uh, to give you an idea, is the distribution of that virus uh, throughout the world. And it's geographically uh, delimited, largely to uh, areas in uh, uh, Southeast Asia and to the Caribbean and uh, Central Africa and Central America, and from there uh, uh, spread throughout, uh, throughout the world. And um, I guess I get the sense that HIV might get a little bit more press than this virus. I mean, is that, is that just me, or do you guys feel the same way? It, OK, so I, I got to ask, if you had a guess, how many people in the world have HIV infection? Roughly. Oh, pick a number. Close your eyes and raise your hand. Nobody will know. <laughs> okay, so we'll do this the virology way. One person, 10 people, 100. It's got to be a log increase. 100, 1,000, 100,000, a million, 10 million, 100 million. 100 million. It's about 30 million, 35 million. So you guys are all virologists because you're within a log. <laughs> now, how many people in the world have HTLV? Ooh, heavy sigh. All right, let's do it again. 10,000, 100,000, a million, 10 million, 100 million, a billion. I'm sorry, I didn't hear. I heard it. It was a million. Who wants a, who wants a million? Who wants higher? Don't your eyes ever been on the prices, right? Who, uh, who wants 10 million? Upwards of about 30 million. So the numbers are actually fairly comparable of the number of people who are infected with HTLV, number of people who are infected with HIV. The difference is with HIV, 99 plus percent will die untreated. 95% of individuals with HTLV will never uh, manifest disease. So it's almost the inverse of the two. But it's good to know, and especially because one of the diseases it causes is, 
is a neoplastic one. Here's the, uh, the HIV-1, and you guys are so smart, you knew it all, uh, and how it's distributed throughout uh, the world. As you can see, it's not, uh, uh, it's not uniform. Neither are, and I think you're probably pretty familiar with the ways people can get this infection, but neither are the risk factors. So here in, uh, in Eastern Europe and Central Asia, uh, IVDU is, uh, some, uh, drug use is close to 70% of all the people who, uh, who get HIV, whereas in South Asia, commercial sex work const constitutes about 50% and down uh, to 22%. Here, in the Caribbean, where HIV is fairly prominent, uh, intravenous drug use is down even further. Uh, men who have sex with men, or the MSM, is at 26 percent. Commercial sex work is a lot lower. And now we have this new category, which is called other, which is a reflection of the stigma that people have from trying to report whether or not uh, or what their risks are for, uh, for HIV infection. And here in the, uh, in the United States, I did something wrong. We're going to have a station break. As bad as these slides are, it's much better than looking at me. So I apologize. <laughs> All right, well, let's go to the phone. So we'll take our first caller. <laughs> but I did want to say, uh, we'll go to the, uh, the United States next and where the uh, uh, this is us in about 2009, and one of those really cool uh, maps there where the size of the, uh, um, of the circle tells you how many people are actually infected. And I think it, uh, it illustrates a lot of uh, our current issue with HIV, that it's not really concentrated in uh, large cities, Oops. although we can find it there. Uh, it's also out. Uh, uh, no state is obviously immune, but some have more than others. And here uh, are the new cases of HIV infection, the incidence, about 50,000 cases a year. No matter what we do for the past 15, 20 years, it's always around 50,000 cases a year. But now it's shifting about half men who have sex with men, 30 percent heterosexual, and then a smaller number IBDU and, uh, and combinations. Uh, some trends are that, uh, and, and these are, I think, very useful things to know when we're uh, uh, appropriating resources, is that African Americans now exceed white non-Hispanics as the most common patients living with HIV and AIDS. There's a geographic spread out of the metropolitan areas. I think we saw that before. Women comprise over 25% uh, of all AIDS cases. Uh, and by uh, 2015, 50% of people living with HIV will be over 50 years of age. So it's a maturing epidemic, and I think we'll see a little bit more of that as we go on. But that's just really, for this planet, those are the two big problems that we have. And so I'd like to discuss them a little bit more uh, in terms of the NIH approach, which is one cell at a time, right? And so if we wanted to, uh, to try and understand what a retrovirus really was and how it got its name, it's not from that period of the 1970s when people were wearing, wearing polyester, but it was really a group of RNA viruses that replicate via DNA intermediate using reverse transcriptase. And during the 1960s, eh, this was a bit of a surprise for a bunch of people who had just, you know, within 15 years had figured out the structure of DNA and how it replicated to find something that was an RNA virus that went back to DNA, I, I think represented a, a real paradigm shift for a, repl uh, a replication paradigm. And since then, I think people have at least proposed that maybe this is not so much a relic, but this is sort of um, one of the things that got us here. So uh, all of you are, you my God, I, I'm looking out here and seeing how smart you are. You all know that this, this planet started out probably 
as an RNA world. So all of our genomes were we here, you know, five billion years ago or so, uh, would have RNA genomes. And, and that was really a problem because RNA was not stable in the presence of the primary poop that these organisms were making at the time, its byproduct, which was oxygen. So as you know, RNA is not very stable in the presence of oxygen or oxygen radicals. So the organisms that survived were the ones that could store their genetic material. Basically, the family jewels had to go in a better safe. And so things that could make DNA were going to outcompete things that could only make RNA. And so um, reverse transcriptase was sort of cool because it could make DNA out of RNA. It could make DNA out of DNA. This was an enzyme that, that many people believe was that really the nexus between the old, uh, the old Earth and the new Earth of the last five million years. And so if you look uh, and uh, go for a walk, go anywhere, even on the NIH campus, every living thing has a remnant of that ancient struggle for DNA organisms uh, over RNA organisms. Every last one of the phyla have, um, uh, have reverse transcriptases in their, uh, uh, in their genomes. And so the viruses, uh, uh -huh. we, some people like to think of them as Jedi Knights that really saved our planet. If we look at the ones that are uh, divided up that we can detect by sequencing their reverse transcriptase, that enzyme that gives them their identity, we find about seven different uh, families. And the ones that infect humans are listed here. Lentiviruses that give us HIV 1 and 2, and uh, BLV or HTLV, which gives us uh, human T cell leukemia and HAM TSP. And, uh, um, and just, uh, I'm skipping over the fact that this is a phylogenetic tree, but I think you probably appreciate that. And if you do, you also appreciate the fact that these two things are not on the same branch. So the fact that they infect the same species does not mean that they're closely related to each other. Uh, HIV 1 and 2 are related to viruses that are found in monkeys and chimpanzees and gorillas, but also uh, viruses that are found in sheep and goats, whereas the ones that infect that cause HTLV are, are related to uh, viruses that are found in, um, in cows. So the, the fact that they both infect humans doesn't mean that they're that closely related to each other. If we look just at the lentivirus relationships, and we'll talk about HIV for a good long while now, uh, I think that uh, we see that, that phenomenon yet again when we look at HIV-1 most closely related to something called simian immunodeficiency virus, and CPZ stands for chimpanzee. In other words, the closest relative of HIV-1 is a virus that's found in chimpanzee. And there's another HIV on this, uh, this phylogenetic tree. It's up here. It's called HIV-2. It's a geographically restricted, generally, virus uh, restricted to West Africa. But it's not most closely related to HIV-1. It's most closely related to a virus that's not even in higher primates. It's in monkeys and, and specifically sooty mangabe monkeys. Uh, and so, you know, HIV-1 isn't even number one or number two. There are other viruses that are much more closely related to HIV-2. So once again, that observation that just because you got into the one species doesn't mean that you have to be as closely related to each other. Um, so here, uh, and I know this is what you're all waiting for, right? This is where we live, right? One nucleotide at a time. This is uh, the, uh, the genome of, uh, of HIV, and it illustrates a really, really cool phenomenon that uh, I think was a very interesting puzzle for early uh, uh, molecular biologists studying this, this virus. And basically, you know, it's a basic virus on one end. It's got regulatory elements over here and some regulatory elements on the, on the other end. And then all in the middle here, a bunch of, uh, uh, of uh, open reading frames. But then looking a little bit closer, it's kind of interesting. The promoter sequences are down at the three prime end. And okay, fine. We have viruses where the promoters are at the three prime end, and they can still promote uh, five prime. But you know, how many of you know has got this uh, poly A sequence at the five prime end and not down here where we really want it? Uh, and I'll come to why in a second. But there is something called a repeat region, identical repeats at each end called R. And then unique regions, U5 and U3, 
unique region at the five prime end, unique region at the three prime end. Are you getting the sense that these people are very concrete about how they name things? You wonder what their children are called. But uh, it just in terms of conventions, the names of the genes are in lowercase, and the protein gene products are capitalized. So when you read papers, it's, not, uh, it's definitely not random. Here's what it looks like once it gets inside the cell. It has to integrate into the genome, as we'll see. And you'll see now uh, there's a, a complete uh, repeat, long terminal repeat here with a U3RU5, U3RU5. And so somewhere in between the virion RNA and the integrated provirus, this thing has gone through replication, not just from RNA into DNA, but also to, uh, to rearrange its uh, genetic material such that the promoter is now at the 5 prime end and um, uh, the poly A sequence is at the 3 prime end. Here, uh, just to, you know, for reference, is a glossary of how these things get their names. And I think you, you're probably used to some of these. RT makes sense. Uh, reverse transcriptase, it's part of the pol gene for polymerase. ENV makes sense for envelope. TAT uh, is actually a transactivator. It kind of makes sense. Uh, REV, a regulator of expression of virion proteins. And GAG, one of my favorites, is not just because it's making you sip, because it's the group antigen that before nucleic acid uh, uh, sequencing and analysis, these was used as the serologic marker that distinguished uh, these viruses. If you look at the regional anatomy, what does this virus look like? Well, it's an envelope virus. It acquires its envelope as it buds out of the cell surface. It has a core that consists of its P24. It has two copies of uh, RNA. They're actually or essentially identical copies, not complementary. Uh, and then it carries its enzymes along with it. Uh, and here, now, just to go through the replication cycle of the, of the virus, because knowing this, uh, and elucidating these steps allowed the development of over 20 antiretroviral drugs that we use to, uh, uh, to, to inhibit the virus. So, and uh, I'm going to highlight, really highlight the steps that are, uh, that are either fascinating or give us a good, really good drug. Now, um, somebody, and it wasn't a virologist, once told me that, you know, you could do all virus replication by just drawing a circle and then drawing an arrow through it. Right? And the circle is the cell, and the arrow is the virus getting in and then getting in. Yes, that's true. But knowing the details and uh, each of the steps gives you specific events in virus replication that can be used as targets to, uh, uh, to stop their replication. And so I want to go through those in just a little bit of detail. And the first one, and this is sort of uh, very interesting, you think of this as, well, the first thing it's got to do is get in, right? So it has to, like, uh, it's got an envelope, the cell's got an envelope, the two envelopes get together, and boing, the next thing you know, the two of them are stuck together. Well, it turns out that that's, uh, that's kind of, no, that's not the way this happens. Because it, it turns out it takes an awful lot of energy to get through a cell membrane. So you need something to drive through that. And secondly, you need something to provide a bit of specificity. So the outside of the HIV virus provides both specificity and the means of, a, uh, uh, of energy to push it through the, uh, the membrane. And it happens through two independent events, one's attachment and one's fusion. So if we take uh, attachment first, there are viral factors, that envelope glycoprotein sitting on the surface recognizes two cell receptors, CD4 and a co-receptor, usually CCR5 or CXCR4. Uh, and then uh, to, to actually, so that gets it to bind to the cell. To actually get it to enter the cell, it needs the second glycoprotein called uh, GP41, which provides the energy to push through that membrane. There are host cell factors that are involved as well. They have to bind to GP120, the CD4, either CXCR4 or CCR5. Unless it engages both the receptor and the co-receptor, it's no deal. Okay? Uh, and so blocking that step is a good idea, because otherwise it's no deal. And so the inhibitor that's available now and is FDA approved is a drug called Maraviroc, which binds blocks the interaction between the HIV envelope and the CCR5 co-receptor. Even though the CD4 receptor has been known for probably 15 years longer, there are not good drugs uh, to block that infection. And perhaps, that, perhaps that's because it's more of an ionic 
uh, uh, interaction than this, which is uh, much more of a, a non-covalent or a non-ionic interaction. The second event uh, that we need is this fusion event. So once it's attached, as I said, it's not just a question of two bubbles uh, joining together. We actually need uh, to drive the virus into that. And once GP120 binds to the surface of the cell, GP41, to which it is non-covalently attached, undergoes a three-dimensional change and exposes a series of alpha helices, six alpha helices, which provide really a spring-like mechanism to drive the virus membrane into the cellular membrane, fuse the two of those in this highly detailed question mark here uh, uh, until the, the virus is actually, the viral membrane fuses with the cell membrane, depositing the, the core of the virus into the cell, uh, the cellular cytoplasm. As you might imagine, something like this, which is really essentially a bunch of alpha helices with a lot of potential energy, that might be also a druggable site. And uh, in fact, uh, a tour de force, really to develop a drug that will actually bind into these alpha helices uh, and provide what I could think of as a monkey wrench that prevents them from, uh, that uh, prevents that fusion event. So 36 amino acid peptide, it's the longest synthesized uh, peptide that's been developed for pharmaceutical use. They had to develop their own building just to produce it. It's relatively expensive. It works real well. And uh, we can develop resistance to it within about two weeks. So if it's used in combination, fine. If not, then not. But uh, two, really, two really great targets against HIV even before the virus gets inside the cell. So uh, these were both, again, a, the product of things that you guys do every day or I assume that many of you do every day, molecular biology, one step at a time. OK, so let's now, uh, let's now imagine that the virus is uh, attached and gotten into the cytoplasm. And the next thing it has to do is undergo this step called uncoding. And it's not like this, but it's a little bit like that, right? Imagine that core that we just saw before has two copies of RNA. And those RNAs and their enzymes have to access the gold in the cell which is really, for, for this step, ATP, right, and other nucleoside triphosphates to, to replicate its genome. Well, it's got to get that core broken apart. And it, you know, you'd think, oh, that just sounds like the easiest little thing. It gets in a cell, and then it sort of falls apart. It turns out that there's a restriction at that level of replication. And it's part of the innate immune system elucidated through HIV, but is probably the case for many viruses. In other words, we have been excluding viruses at this stage for millions of years. And in fact, because we didn't get it right, because we were basically fighting the last war, we were able to exclude the previous set of viruses. We didn't, we didn't have the right mechanism to exclude this one. So the proteins that exclude um, uh, HIV are actually found in things like monkeys and are not found in us. And the amino acid differences are very, very few. So it's one of those, it's another one of those things, for the lack of a nail, we lost the war. Uh, but this is a, a, a series of steps that requires the virus gag protein, that thing that makes the structure of the core, and the cell, this trim 5-alpha, which normally restricts virus uh, uncoding, but in the case of HIV, is unable to do so. So, and here's the illustration of that. If you take uh, the, the trim 5 alpha gene product from humans, chimps, and monkeys, and the virus from HIV, the SIV that's in chimp, and the SIV that's in monkeys, there are circumstances where the monkeys can restrict HIV, but, uh, um, uh, but humans cannot. So uh, in this example, HIV can't infect monkeys because its trim 5-alpha is just that much different that it can exclude uh, the virus based exclusively on uncoding. OK, so uh, it's gotten past that uncoding step. And now we come to the sort of the central enzymatic step defining this virus, pop, uh, this virus class. And it's reverse transcriptase. And you know, if there were, and whenever I do this and that people have exams, like you can cheat when it comes to reverse transcriptase because this is the X-ray crystallographic 
uh, depiction of reverse transcriptase. And as it turns out, it looks like a lot of DNA polymerases. It's like a right hand. So it has a thumb, and it's got fingers, and I'm sure it didn't take that much imagination. It took a lot of imagination to get this, uh, to say uh, there's a palm and fingers and a thumb. But it's actually true. It looks like your right hand. The catalytic activity is, very, is at the surface of, uh, of your thumb. And it's interesting in that in developing resistance to some of the drugs, you can see their resistance mutations that occur right where the binding, socket, uh, the, the binding uh, uh, sites are. So this uh, understanding this gene is at that level, you know, almost at an amino acid position level where we can um, uh, determine what the effects of certain drugs will be. Mutations that change the nature of these binding pockets exclude drugs and uh, result in, uh, in drug resistance. So I'd like to talk a little bit more about that. But first, uh, to just list the enzymatic activities. And I mentioned a few of them before. So the first thing it can do is take RNA and turn it into DNA, an RNA-dependent DNA polymerase, the first uh, uh, identified of, of its kind. It also, you can just imagine, you know, okay, so I run off a copy of, um, uh, I copy the DNA into RNA. Now I have an RNA-DNA uh, hybrid. I want to make a DNA-DNA. I got to get rid of that RNA. It has an enzymatic activity called RNAsH that degrades an RNA-DNA copy uh, hybrid. Not completely. It leaves a few uh, uh, RNA molecules back in there that can supply the primer for the next round of DNA-dependent DNA polymerase. We talk about uh, reverse transcriptase, and a lot of you probably use it for uh, a lot of the things that you do in a lab as just a tool. And everybody says, oh, it's got a lousy, you know, it's, a, it's got a big error rate. I, and that's got to be because it's a primordial enzyme or something like that. I want to argue that it's not because it's a crummy enzyme. I'm going to argue that it's actually part of its pathogenic determinants. So its error rate is somewhere between 1 and 4 uh, per 100,000 bases synthesized. I wish I guess I made mistakes on that frequency. I'd be doing a lot better. Uh, recombination can also occur during the reverse transcription. And this replica replication is both rapid and error prone. So the fact that we have very diverse populations of viruses isn't just because it makes errors. It makes errors and it replicates every very, very quickly on the order of once a day. So the combination of those two things gives us a very uh, diverse population in any infected individual. And that gives us this second piece uh, and really a, uh, uh, an observation, uh, an insightful observation by, by John Coffin at Tufts who suggested even before we knew a lot about the drugs, that if that's the case, then mutations in, in genomes, in virus populations, that confer resistance to drugs are likely to be present before we start the antiretroviral regimens, which is pretty much why one drug won't do the job, because you'll get resistance so quickly, something that replicates on a daily basis. So uh, uh, we need at least two to three drugs, three drugs being the optimum, uh, to suppress the ability of the virus to, uh, uh, to uh, have uh, resistance emerge. And so here's a, here's a typical example of that, OK? Here's a position in the reverse transcriptase gene. And it's at position 151. And normally, there's a glutamine there. And the, uh, the, the, the triplet codon for that in this particular case is CAG. Well, you know you make one lousy change. You can go from CAG to CTG. Every time you hit a second base in a codon, you always change the amino acid. OK, fine. CTG, leucine. From CAG to AAG, in another direction, I get a lysine. Fine. So a single nucleotide change, something that should occur every time this thing replicates, can give me one of these and can give me one of these. And all of those can exist at any given time to some degree. Yeah, this one's better. Maybe it's 99% of the virus that's there. Who cares? 1% of the virus? That's a lot of virus in an infected individual who may have as many as 10 to the 5th or 10 to the 6th infected cells donating its genes to the next generation. All right, so fine. I got a bunch of these and these and, and this one. Now, there's a, a whole series of antiretrovirals that can inhibit this particular virus. And then these can inhibit reasonably as well. 
but make one more change. Go from AAG or CTG to ATG and get a methionine at that position. And this virus, the, the virus that contains this reverse transcriptase, is resistant to an entire class, essentially of antiretroviral drugs. So the ability to accommodate sort of a diverse population, a society that cares about its fringes, can have enough of these uh, low-level mutants to have them in stock when the drugs are available. Now, you know, the virus did not, I don't think, do this knowing that we were going to invent antiretrovirals. But it is a product uh, that can, or it is a function that can be useful when you're trying to in, in, evade an immune system. You can just imagine the same function for at, a, at a CTL escape site or an antibody uh, uh, binding site can afford a much faster or dynamic response to, uh, uh, to, uh, to a suppressive therapy to allow a virus to emerge. So this rapid and error-prone virus thing that you think is some remnant of an RNA world is likely to be kept around because it's, um, it's a fairly useful pathogenic determinant. OK, so now we've got the virus uh, uh, reverse transcribed. And the next thing, this double-stranded DNA molecule has to integrate into the host genome. It does that through uh, a viral uh, gene called integrase. There are now excellent, probably the best drugs developed in the last 15 years are integrase inhibitors which block this uh, step of integrating the double-stranded linear molecule into the host genome. Once it's in, uh, the enemy is within. And now, the virus uses exclusively, almost exclusively, uh, host processes to make the next set of viruses. So uh, here's an RNA virus where its, it's principal enzyme, reverse transcriptase, doesn't know how to make RNA. Knows how to make DNA, knows how to make it out of RNA, knows how to make it out of DNA but it can't make RNA. So it uses the host RNA pol 2 to make its RNA. It processes that RNA. You saw all those gene products. It's got to go do that uh, alternative splicing thing, a little bit of that, a lot of that. It balances that using host and, uh, and viral factors, but basically has to make a family of RNA molecules to make all of those gene products, which are then translated uh, by cellular machinery, assembled at the cell surface, and then uh, to undergo a maturational step uh, at the cell surface. And that maturational step requires uh, protein processing. So the, um, the envelope proteins are processed by uh, a cellular enzyme, probably furin. And the gag proteins, which make the final structural part and the enzymes, are processed by a, um, a viral protein called protease. And so here's uh, an electron microscopic depiction of the virus as it's just budding out of the cell. And I think you can tell uh, these, are, these are known as immature particles because after some time, they start to look like this. Right? This has a thicker membrane. As many of you know who do electron microscopy, and there's an electron microscope right outside if you want to look. Uh, but it's really looking at the positions of the heavy metals that bind to this uh, structure when it's being stained. So you stain it with lead or you stain it with tungsten. Always with a positively charged heavy ion that will deflect the x-ray beam as it comes in. Well, you know, what's all those positive charges going to bind to? Yeah, they're going to bind to some proteins. No question about it. And you can see those on the surface. But the most of what it's going to be binding to are those phosphate groups in the, uh, in the nucleic acid. So here what we're really looking at largely is where the RNA is. And it's plastered up on the inside of the, the, the spherical particle. Whereas over here, it's in a much more condensed fashion and complex with the, the gag protein. Why would he be going through this? Because the important thing here is, is that this virus is not infectious. And this virus is infectious. So unless you make this step that's, uh, that's mediated by HIV protease, all you do is make a bunch of non-infectious particles. We can, you know, grab victory from the jaws of defeat if we can block this step. Uh, and protease inhibitors were actually that uh, step that was uh, blocked. So uh, the, in the development of, uh, of antiretrovirals, that was a key piece. And so I, I just wanted to show this because this was on 
uh, buses and all kinds of uh, billboards back about um, 25 years ago before the development of antiretrovirals. Uh, and it was encouraging people to get tested. Uh, and they were reminding people that if you got the AIDS virus today, you and your license could expire at the same time. And so the half-life of people with HIV infected was actually quite short. And now it's almost just about the same as uninfected controls. And the difference is listed here in the rest of this slide. The development of all the antiretrovirals uh, starting in 1987 with the approval of this drug that's off to the side, AZT, uh, and on with, again, nucleoside NRTIs, nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors, uh, protease inhibitors here in blue, uh, another class of reverse transcriptase inhibitors. And I think you get the feeling that everything up to here in 2002 was an enzyme inhibitor. And you can think of that as a triumph of how we do high throughput screening. We need a really good assay to do that, and an enzyme is a great way to screen for, uh, for inhibitors. But with time, we're able to find fusion inhibitors. This is the one that blocks GP41. We're able to find uh, uh, CCR5 blocking CD4, Maravroc here, and then again, uh, uh, looking at uh, uh, integrase uh, enzyme inhibitors. So because of this um, timeline, people with HIV infection uh, identified now can live almost a, uh, uh, a complete life. Now, uh, one thing that would be great is one thing you notice now that you know all about the molecular biology is that, as I mentioned, once the virus integrates, the enemy is within. And unless that cell dies, that cell keeps that genome. In other words, to get rid of the virus, none of, if, if, if you can't get rid of the infected cells, and these drugs don't kill cells, they only block transmission. The only way to cure this virus is to generate new, I think, um, uh, new strategies to, uh, to address those reservoirs of infected cells. So um, I, I want to move now just to talk about how these viruses infect human populations. And just to remind you here about, again about these lentivirus relationships, um, HIV-1 and HIV-2. And I won't say very much about HIV-2 because it's a, really a special case of HIV-1. Um, but before I get to that, I wanted to just come back to this um, and highlight the HTLV-1 situation, because I won't be saying very, uh, very much more about it. As I mentioned, most of the people with HIV, uh, HTLV infection uh, are not um, um, uh, uh, affected by the disease. The diseases they can get are the ones listed here. Um, uh, acute T-cell leukemia which can happen after about 30 years. People are generally infected uh, through breast milk through their mother. Um, it's approximately one to a couple of percent of all the HTLV infected individuals. And because it, it introduces a kind of an immune deficiency, there are specific infectious complications that are associated with individuals with this, uh, uh, with this syndrome, including TB, MAC, leprosy, pneumocystis, strongyloides, chronic strongyloides, scabies. Uh, and it can come along with uh, some other events, which we don't have time to talk about that, but they are really uh, uh, quite interesting. Uh, we can also, you can also get a second uh, disease called uh, uh, HTLV-associated myelopathy by the virus infecting cells in the central nervous system. And I think I'll just uh, skip over those and move on to HIV, but just so you know that retroviruses uh, is not restricted to the thing I just happen to be interested in. Um, the, the, as, you, as you noticed from that, uh, that family tree of HIV, it seemed HIV-1 was most closely related to, um, uh, to viruses that were seen in the chimpanzee populations. Now, how did they figure that out? I don't know. How many people are postdocs here? Ah, wonderful. Imagine your postdoc was to go to Africa and figure this problem out. Let's see if we can find the virus in chimps. Kind of cool. They were looking for SIV in monkeys. That was easy. You could trap a monkey, you could bleed a monkey, you could let the monkey go. Can't do that with chimps. And there's only two things you can get from a chimp in, in these places, which were preserves. One of them is, uh, uh, is stool, and the other one is urine. And they can be pretty sure about which, because they know these, these chimps very, very well. You could be pretty sure about which chimp had uh, uh, had left what gift for which postdoc. 
But uh, a couple of postdocs went to a couple of these preserves in these places across, uh, across Central and West Africa looking for the presence of HIV in different chimpanzee populations. And lo and behold, yes, they found it. Oops. Um, yeah. um, they were able to find it in the ones in Central and West Africa, but not this population of chimps, which probably diverged from this group about 10,000 years ago. So the theory is that, that you know, this, the viruses like this are very, very prevalent in lower primates and monkeys. And so the thought was is that because chimps do eat monkeys, that there were opportunities for there to be um, a transmission of some SIVs into, uh, into the chimp population. And then growth in the chimp population, I think, made it much, much easier for it to uh, make the zoonotic jump into human populations. And so in this family tree, we can see the human viruses that infect the majority of individuals, probably over 30 million uh, in the world, highly related to these SIV chimpanzee viruses found in Gabon, uh, in a captive monkey in the United States, in, uh, in the Cameroon. And so um, using pure uh, brute force sequencing and phylogenetics, it was possible to identify viruses uh, exactly like uh, those in, um, uh, in, uh, in humans. And in fact, their antibodies recognize our virus. As you can see in these, uh, in a series of Western blots of samples of uh, antibodies reconstructed, or, or I guess uh, renatured from stool. So they make enough antibodies that they could get, take stool, put it in ammonium persulfate to, to uh, uh, to, to basically um, um, get it out of solution, send it to the United States, dialyze out the ammonium sulfate. You guys do this on a daily basis, just not with poop. And then uh, renature the antibodies and show that they, could, uh, that they would work in a commercial HIV West. So how does one get to the other, right? And it's thought to be through the bushmeat trade in Central and West Africa. Okay. Uh, primates have been eating primates for thousands and thousands of years. Some of those primates have retroviruses in them, and if you're exposed to the, uh, um, uh, to the right one, perhaps it can get uh, into the, the higher primate, in this case, the poacher. So that person brings this uh, animal, this happens to be a sooty mangabee, but this story is the same for a chimp, and brings it to a place called a chop house, which is essentially a butcher. Uh, making different cuts of meat that can be used uh, both in the home and in restaurants and sold at places called bushmeat markets. So it's likely that this was the, uh, perhaps the initiating event. Now, you guys are smart. You're saying, this has been happening for thousands of years. How come we get to be so lucky, right? How come it's our generation that has to deal with this? And I think, you know, I don't know the answer, but I think um, most people think the answer has to do with the difference between starting a fire and spreading a fire. So perhaps this is the kind of thing that's happened a lot. Uh, but it, it had to spread. <coughs> and just to tell you how much it spread, here are the different kinds of HIV viruses uh, listed here that we find in humans. And again, using phylogenetic technique, actually not phylogenetic, the more Bayesian techniques, that they're able to trace the virus back to probably making that zoonotic jump somewhere between 1911 and 1945. And some people think it was even earlier in the 1880s. And but it diversified very, very early. So we have a lot of different kinds of viruses in human populations. This did not start in the 1970s. This started uh, much, much earlier. And I, as I think, it, it probably did happen a lot, but it never took off. What made it take off, I think, um, I don't know why. Uh, uh, I, th I think there are a lot of things that are associated with HIV spread. Obviously, the things that will get it into a human, transfusions, eh, probably not vaccinations, mother to child, blood and body fluid is where we're talking about. But then what makes it spread are probably non-biological things, political things, economic things, and maybe multiple epidemics. So if you think of what did, um, uh, here's Africa in the, um, uh, the early 1800s. And it's sort of divided up into colonial interests. And then here's it around the, st the time of the First World War. And then um, 
in a more modern time, uh, depicting when these individual countries uh, gained their independence from their colonial uh, 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 countries. So a, a huge change in, in just a very, very short period. And that upheaval that's been associated with a lot of population change, which has also been associated with a significant amount of malnutrition, malnutrition to a great degree equals immunodeficiency, perhaps provided larger populations of individuals who perhaps were more susceptible to infection with this virus. The second point is a, is a very, very large increase in, uh, in the human populations on this continent and a loss of habitat for the primate populations, perhaps pushing those two uh, uh, together a little bit uh, at a higher concentration. So uh, the consequences of both political upheaval, expansion of populations are thought to contribute to the, uh, to the spread of, this, uh, of the sparks that have probably always been occurring. Here's um, uh, another one of those forms of spread that was easier to document using epidemiologic tools. And it's called the, the Trans-Africa Highway. And I, when I think of the Trans-Africa Highway, I think of something like 270. But in fact, this is the Trans-Africa Highway. And it was a, a, a route that was taken by truckers uh, going across the center of Africa. And it's punctuated by, uh, uh, by roadside inns, not uh, Marriott's, but a little bit more uh, uh, rustic than that, where people can get a meal and obviously have opportunities to transmit the virus to other humans. And so uh, as a result of that, the virus probably diversified early in Africa and then spread to the rest of the world, probably but through a series of, uh, of founder effects. And as you can see, if we labeled all the different flavors of virus uh, by letters, you can see that here is the most diverse area, as you'd expect, where it diversified. And then here in the United States, we largely have a single type. 95% of our viruses are, uh, are subtype B. And that, that likelihood, uh, or that, that observation, probably came through uh, some early founder effects. There are some very uh, dramatic and um, uh, spectacular stories of uh, individuals thinking that they were patient zero. So I don't know if any of you have had the opportunity to read a book called And the Band Played On by Randy Schultz. It's a great account of what happened in those early years and, and a pretty good description of what happens at the NIH or what did happen at the NIH uh, in the middle 1980s. But there was this great story in there about a particular um, uh, airline steward by, by the name of Gaetan Dugas, who assumed that he was patient zero uh, because he had the disease so early. But in fact, you know, this is where science really marches on. And nerds like us trumped um, uh, that observation. And a fellow by the name of Mike Warobi out at the University of Arizona collected viruses that were found in Africa, that were found in Haiti, that were found in the United States very early in the epidemic, and again used these Bayesian techniques to say, you know, the oldest viruses are all in Africa, and from them we can find viruses. The most closely related ones are in Haiti, and the second round is in the United States. So it's most likely uh, an interaction between uh, Haitian and African uh, advisors that were exchanged to a great degree in, uh, in the 1960s where that virus first started to enter into the uh, Western Hemisphere and from there into the United States. And so here's, uh, here's what the, uh, uh, the epidemic looked like when, um, I guess some, a lot of you weren't born yet, but uh, cases in the United, first cases in the United States, in Dallas, in Miami, and in Los Angeles, these being reported by Dr. Henry Mazur, who's still here, uh, head of the uh, uh, critical care in Building 10. And here, just very quickly, how the epidemic spread. And it kind of looks like, at this point, what you might see if you were flying over the United States at, at night, the uh, 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 most uh, densely populated areas having the most uh, sets of cases. But as I say, things are moving out into the country, looking a lot into the country, looking a lot more like this. So, you know, I don't know. What does this kind of stuff really tell us? A couple of things. Uh, one is that uh, you really can learn a lot from, uh, from an, a, a good and tractable model of molecular biology. Um, and, you know, some people are vi think viruses are bad. 
and should be avoided. And in general, that's probably the case. But in the case of retroviruses, they probably, you know, it's a good bet that they, uh, they save the planet, at least for DNA uh, organisms. Uh, and perhaps they may save us by uh, helping our trim 5 alphas or selecting trim 5 alphas. Uh, it can save us from the next round of a lethal uh, pandemic. Epidemics are probably not single events. Uh, and I think they're complicated and they mature over time. I think the problems that we have now that we're facing with HIV, more of an endemic. Eh, about 1% of the population has HIV. As I said, 50,000 a year, whether, uh, no matter how hard we try, is a different problem than a, um, a, a, spectac a spectacular epidemic spread of virus, exponentially increasing. So I think I'll, I'll stop there. I have a couple of minutes. I can't believe that, uh, you know, that Terry's always making me stop because I'm always slow. But, uh, but if there are questions, maybe we can take them before uh, Eve comes. Oh. Yeah, so, uh, so the question has to do with uh, genetic variation of the virus uh, as, uh, as essentially a geographic signal. Or some viruses uh, speci have specific mutations in others. So if you take, um, uh, and this is an, an area that we we're actually very interested in, because uh, if you, uh, individuals, uh, so the answer is in general, the virus is divided up, the main one is divided up into about 10 different groups of viruses labeled by letters, and they're distinguished by about being 10% different at the, uh, at the nucleotide level from another group. So if you're about 10% different, then you, uh, you get to be another group. But within that group, there's a great deal of diversity. And that, you know, for me, genetic diversity is information. And that information can be used for uh, 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 geographic uh, identification. So one thing we're doing is using these viruses and the sequences of these viruses to tell whether uh, the, the, the infection may have occurred in this country or another, even though it's a single subtype, in this city or another. Uh, and obviously to find viruses with a common, um, uh, with a common ancestor. So I, I, I do think that's the kind of thing that's a very uh, attractable problem, especially since everybody who's now diagnosed, newly diagnosed, with HIV infection actually gets a sequence done. So if we arrange this right, it will be possible to do just that kind of, uh, it's called uh, phylogeography, using uh, Bayesian techniques to, uh, uh, to, uh, to localize the, the common ancestors of viruses. Yeah, so that's a, that's a really good question. Obviously something uh, the NCI and our, uh, our research group is something that's very uh, interested in. And I think that there are big gaps in getting to, to win, basically. Uh, and I think so our research is really um, centering on trying to uh, eliminate those gaps. So we're trying to understand, you know, if there is a reservoir, what's it composed of? How many you know, infectious viruses are present and, and where are they located and, uh, and, and how do we, are they actively replicating? Uh, or are these all latently infected cells? So the strategies that are out in the news now have to deal with uh, uh, using agents that can essentially reverse latency with the expectation that cells that are latently infected with HIV that are then turned on will make virus, they won't transmit it because of the presence of antiretrovirals, but then they're die, they'll die by some uh, 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 apoptotic mechanism and hopefully won't expand uh, while they're doing it. So that's a so-called shock and kill uh, uh, scenario. And I think um, this, uh, this research is in its infancy, if it's not even in its pregnancy yet. So I think uh, it's, it's, these are early days, but obviously the bone marrow transplant 
is a tantalizing and spectacular um, anecdote of what might be possible. Well, I, I, I wanted to hear Eve. <laughs> Okay, so we've mentioned before that <clears throat> the topoise homerase inhibitors, they're very good drugs for various cancer patients. And our next speaker, Yves Pommier, received his MD and PhD from the University of Paris in France. He's been at NIH since 1981. He's chief of the Laboratory of Molecular Pharmacology. His title today, DNA topoisomerases and their poisoning by anti-cancer and antibacterial drugs. Yves. Thanks, Terry. Thanks, everybody. Um, <clears throat> so this is um, a review on the uh, topoisomerase inhibitors. Um, and um, it's a challenge to do it because there are many drugs and also because there are many enzymes. So the first slide refers you to two most recent reviews. Uh, usually when people write reviews, it's, usually, it's either antibacterial or it's TOPO2 inhibitors, or it's TOPO1 inhibitors, but there are not so many reviews that cover everything in one review, so that was the challenge of these two reviews that are listed here. But if you wanted to know more, there is a book that was uh, published last year, which is pretty much up to date, and now it will go all the way to the archaebacteria um, and all the, the, the kingdoms and, and where the topoisomerases are, because wherever there is DNA, there has to be a topoisomerase. Uh, and the reason is that DNA is the, probably the longest polymer in the cell, so it's a very uh, complicated uh, molecule to disentangle. And the best example is your garden hose, which is not that long compared to what the DNA is, is in a way. In one cell, you have about two meters of DNA, if you put uh, lengthwise, obviously separated in the chromosomes. But each piece is very long, so the challenge is how do you keep track of this? How do you prevent this, that it becomes tangled? How is it organized? And that's what the topoisomerases will do, is to deal with that complexity in the context of chromatin. Uh, so not counting uh, SPO11, uh, there are three types of topoisomerases, and there are six genes in humans. And these genes um, are in the order of appearance. Uh, they've been numbered like the building of the NIH. Uh, first, I guess, director's building has to be one. But then they're historically numbered. So number one was the first topoisomerase discovered uh, by Jim Wong initially in uh, E. coli, and shortly after by Jim Dulbeko and Jim Shampoo in, uh, in murine cell extracts. And they were called top one, topo one. Later on, the second family was discovered, then was referred to topo two, and then topo three. In each of these uh, families, there are two genes in humans, so it's somewhat easy to remember, that makes six. And in the case of the type ones, So the reason they are divided in type 1A and, YB and 1B is, again, historical. 1A, because it was the first topo 1 discovered, therefore A, and the next discovered B. A was discovered in E. coli, so it's bacterial topoisomerase 1. And in humans, that topoisomerase is actually top 3. So the first uh, uh, mammalian topoisomerase discovered was top 1, top 1B. One just after top 1A. And the most recently uh, discovered topoisomerase, and I think the last one, now that we know the whole genome, it's unlikely that we'll find another one, is top 1MT, top 1 mitochondrial. So in the top 1B, the two genes, top 1 is the topoisomerase 1 that deals with the nuclear genome, and top 1MT is the topoisomerase that deals with the mitochondrial genome because Human cells and mammalian cells have two types of DNA. There is the nuclear DNA, and there is a mitochondrial DNA, which in some cells could be a few percent of the total DNA. So this is our maternal DNA, and that's dealt with with top 1 MT. Both genes, all these genes are encoded in the nucleus, including top 1 MT. It's not encoded in mitochondrial DNA. It's in the nuclear genome. Uh, and then two top, top 2 
Um, were discovered in humans, there are two forms, two alpha and two beta, so it probably was a duplication during evolution from an ancestral top two, uh, and, and uh, in yeast you have only one top two, and then the top threes. Uh, one other thing is an introduction to remember, uh, to simplify the complexity, in the top isomerases that are odd numbers uh, are single-strand DNA cleaving enzyme, and even number, top two, cleaves two strands at a time. So why is that so important? So in the case of topo one, all the enzymes will cleave one strand of DNA or both strands, and that's the way you would unravel your garden hose. Uh, the cleverness of the system is that, and, and the, the, the beauty of it is that to disentangle the hose, you'll cut it, but the enzyme will piece it back right away, faithfully. And that's the way the topoisomerases deal with DNA topology, knots, and tangles. And uh, in the case of topo1, when they do this, they covalently attach to uh, an, uh, an end of the DNA. And the topo1 is the only topoisomerase that attaches to the three prime end. That's what these schemes wants to show you. Whereas the topo2 and topo3 always attach to the five prime end. What the scheme also shows is the substrates for topo1 and topo2 is duplex DNA, whereas for top3, as is subtly shown here, it's melted. Topo3, which is the same as E. coli topo1, will cleave and process single-stranded region in duplex DNA, but is not very efficient in duplex DNA. These are large enzymes. The smallest is topo1MT, 70 kilodalton, and when they form this intermediate, which we call the cleavage complex, they are covalently attached and make this big bulky adduct. So comparison between humans and E. coli again. So in humans, as I mentioned, there are three uh, types, 1A, 1B, 2A. And in E. coli, uh, there are also uh, six uh, genes, but there are only two types. In fact, E. coli doesn't really have, doesn't have a 1B, uh, doesn't deal with that 1B enzyme. And, and this is the distribution. In E. coli, on the other hand, the 2A is expanded. There are two uh, enzymes, gyrase and topo4. And gyrase in E. coli is made of two subunits, gyr A and gyr B. So there are, there are two genes. And there are two genes for topo4, and they come together. And you'll see later that actually this simplifies. So why is this important for medicine? Is because top one is the anti-cancer target of camptotestins and other drugs that are used to cure cancer or to treat cancer. Top two, alpha and beta, are the anti-cancer targets of very widely used anti-cancer agents, such as doxorubicin, which is probably among the most widely used anti-cancer agents, Etoposide or mitoxantrone, and gyrase and topo4 are the target of the antibacterial quinolone. And the quinolones are very, very well established. They're very efficient drugs, uh, antibacterial. So the topoisomerases, when they cleave DNA, utilize the same mechanism, which is a tyrosine. In each of these enzymes, there is a tyrosine residue, uh, which uh, acts as a nucleophile to attack the DNA backbone. And the, when the enzyme is bound to the DNA, the trick is it brings this tyrosine in the right geometry and position to attack the phosphodiester backbone. So depending on the enzyme, the attack will result either of, in the covalent linkage to the three prime end, so it all depends on the geometry, or linkage to the five prime end. So as I indicated, top one is the only one linking to the three prime end. All the others link to the five prime end, top two or top three. It means that in E. coli, for instance, the only linkage is five prime linkage. And in human is, in this case, is three prime linkage. And in this sense, top one is a different enzyme from the top two or top three. And it belongs to the family of tyrosine recombinase. Cree recombinase, lambda integrase, or tyrosine recombinase linking to the three prime end. So vertebrates or uh, eukaryotes uh, developed this enzyme as a DNA relaxing enzyme, but it's derived from recombinase. 
whereas E. coli never evolved towards this direction, only uses top two or top three to manage its DNA in terms of relaxation of its chromosomes. So we'll review first top one, then I'll go into top two. So top one, DNA relaxation by top one. The enzyme was discovered uh, serendipitously by uh, Jim Wong, as he says, if you read his book. Uh, one of his children was ill and he left the centrifuge uh, at, and then he realized when he came back too late compared to what he wanted that the DNA was relaxed. And he called the enzyme that was relaxing the DNA the omega protein based on the rotor, uh, that calculation, that was the unit for the rotors because that was a centrifugation. And at the same time, but when Dubeco discovered the enzyme, he called it, with Jim Shampoo, the DNA untwisting enzyme. Because when you take supercoiled DNA, so if you extract any DNA, bacterial DNA, viral DNA, and then you purify it, it's supercoiled. It's negatively supercoiled. And a little drop of extract totally untwists this. And the untwisting occurs extremely efficiently in the absence of magnesium, in the absence of ATP, even at zero degrees. And this is the DNA untwisting enzyme. And the way it goes is that the topo one links to the, makes a break, links to the three prime end, let the broken strand rotate around the intact strand at very high velocity, about 6,000 RPM, which is about 120 hertz, uh, very fast re uh, removal of supercoiling. And as soon as the DNA is relaxed, the top isomerase then religates the DNA. So the religation is the reverse. In the cleavage complex, the top one is linked to the three prime end. As soon as the DNA realigns, this attacks back and it reverses. And this reaction is usually favored toward religation. So the cleavage complex is very transient normally. And this relaxes the DNA. Single molecule analysis have been done or being done in this building by Kier Newman, for instance, who is, can measure this velocity and the rotation. It's what we call the controlled rotation. The free end rotates inside the enzyme with some, we call friction, but it's controlled, and then it's religated. So top one is essential for transcription and replication, because if you take, uh, intuitively it's very easy to understand, if I give you the end of a rope and I hold the other end, and then I start untwisting the two, you'll see very quickly some bundles accumulating and I will not be able to separate. The only way transcription and replication can progress is having an untwisting enzyme as this moves along. So topoisomerase one is coupled with transcription and replication to enable them to move at their right velocity along the chromosome. So when these tracking machines, such as replication machinery, transcription machinery, or chromatin remodeling, separate the two strands, helicases, supercoiling is built ahead, positive supercoiling, hyper-twisting, and behind you have the reverse, the negative supercoiling, which is the uh, sort of untwisting of the DNA. And what the top isomerase one do, um, say it's to uh, relax this supercoiling and just readjust all the time the degree of supercoiling in the DNA. And you could see here an example where you have a supercoiled loop and topo one will just relax that loop as the processes move along. However, these cleavage complexes that are normally invisible that you and I are undergoing as we speak, sometimes get stuck. And they can get stuck under three conditions in the cell. One is if you have a drug, let's say you're treated for cancer and you're treated with camptotensin, they will be stalled. The other one is if the DNA damage template is damaged, the topo one gets stuck. And the other one during apoptosis, we see also a large number of cleavage complexes. So these are the three conditions where these topo one cleavage complexes accumulate. And for our purpose today, what we care is about the drug induced topo one cleavage complexes. Going back to the topos, if you wish uh, to compare the two human topos, uh, the two genes, so the nuclear top one, which is a classical top one, if you wish, people refer to it as top one. And when one refers to the mitochondrial top one, all we do is add MT. So when we clone the gene, initially that was a struggle. Should we change nomenclature or not? And we decided just to add MT. This way that didn't change the name of the prior topo isomerase. 
we could have called it topo A1A or 1B, but we, I think it's the decision that we made at the time, and I think it was fair. Uh, so the difference, so the catalytic tyrosine on both enzymes in the C terminus, you could see the very high degree of similarity, and the change is in the N terminus. The nuclear topo 1 has a long N terminus, it's like, a, like got a B head, and it has a nuclear localization sequence. The top one MT has a very small head, and it's mostly a mitochondrial targeting sequence. Uh, these two genes, uh, when we track them down through evolution, diverge at the core dates. If you go in, in, uh, in the yeast, there's only one top one gene. But as soon as you emerge to the vertebrates, there's a duplication likely of that ancestral gene. And then all vertebrates have a top one MT and a top one. And if you go back in also towards evolution, in the virus, such as variola virus, the vaccina virus, has its own topoisomerase, which is quite similar, but it's a truncated, it's an, a very short version of it. And then some bacteria also have a top 1B, but most bacteria do not have a top 1B. Uh, the relevance of talking about vaccinia top 1 here is that you may be using without knowing a topoisomerase 1 for your recombination reaction. When you bind the clone, clone tech or clone, uh, I don't remember the company now, uh, that sells the topo clone uh, tech, it's, it's just a topo 1 vaccinia linked to the end of the DNA and it just religates and it's a recombinase type reaction, but it's used with vac vaccinia top 1. The drugs. They were discovered in the uh, 70s, late 60s by um, under the sponsorship of the NCI, and the structures was uh, elucidated by Monroe Wall and Mansukwani under a contract with the NCI, and at the same time, they also resolved the structure of Taxol. Um, they named all these drugs were then named cantotesin, and they were put in clinical trial in the 70s as the sodium salt. The drugs were uh, quickly uh, uh, removed from clinical trials because there were some side effects, the target was unknown, and clinicians had other drugs in their basket, and they figured that one was just put on the trash. However, in the 90s, when the target of camptotesin was discovered as being topo 1, there was a great interest to resuscitate camptotesin, and two drug companies, SmithKline, uh, GlaxoSmithKline now, uh, uh, made a water-soluble derivative of Cantotesin, which they named Topotican, and in Japan, uh, a prodrug, water-soluble, called Irinotican. And then the drug went back to clinical trial, and today they are approved. They have been approved for over 10 years now. Topotican is used for ovarian cancer, and uh, Irinotican primarily for colon cancer. Uh, they're also used in lung cancer. They're also used in pediatric tumors with some relatively good activity. And then if you're in Korea, you would see Belotican. But Belotican is not used in the United States or in, in Europe. I think it's limited to Asia. Uh, so the, the interesting thing about the cantotesin is that they revealed something very special about the way they block the topo isomerase. And that came from the fact that this molecule, as you could see, uh, sort of looked like a fused base pair. At first approximation, they look like a DNA intercalating drug. But when it was tried, campotesin does not intercalate into DNA. So it was unclear how it would block topo 1. Uh, so the way it blocks, really, when topo 1 cleaves and religates DNA, as I mentioned, it just makes a nick. And the nicks uh, religate very quickly. And normally, you don't see them. When you put campotesin, just a little drop of it in your mixture, you start seeing these cleavage complexes, but they remain reversible because if you heat the sample or put salt, it will reverse. So the binding had to be reversible. Uh, at the time, many, many years ago now, in the uh, 90s, uh, we didn't know how that worked, so we just sequenced the cleavage site, and we found that the cleavage sites with cantotesin had a bias, very strong bias, for having a thymine at minus one position, guanine at plus one position, and that led us to hypothesize that camptotesin was binding at the cleavage site, trapping the complex and inhibiting the religation. We sort of called it a foot in the door. If you wish, the door opens, the drug gets in, can't close anymore, 
but it's reversible. So it's sort of shifting the equilibrium. It took 10 years to see the crystal structure by Jim Shampoo's group and Wim Hall to validate the, the, the hypothesis. And you could see it here. And in gray is the topo 1, in green is the DNA, and topo tecan is in purple, nested inside the complex. And when you uh, undress these topo isomerase, you could see here the backbone. Now the drug is exactly as shown here. It's stacked between the base pairs. It's reversible, but it stacks. It slows down the whole reaction. And that's what's very toxic for the cells. So after this was done, we did ourselves a number of crystal structure with Matt Redinbo and Lance Stewart, who actually started a small company at the time based on crystal structure of topo 1, uh, which we supported just by uh, working with them, not, not in any other way, as a small business initiative. And then Lance Company had been bought uh, by Decode, uh, and then now it's, it's really quite a success. So the idea was to co-crystallize a number of drugs to develop and uh, for a commercial purpose. But I have nothing to do with that. This is Lance's work. And nevertheless, the campotestines what what started the idea of doing this. So for instance, this is another topo 1 inhibitor. This is the ones I will be mentioning shortly, the adenoisoquinoline. And you could see this very pleasing crystal structure, which we call ternary complex, because three things are in the complex, the DNA in blue, the enzyme, topo 1 in yellow, and the drug in green. And you could see the drug here, which is stacked. This is the break. And the drug just falls right in the cleavage site and stabilizes the cleavage site reversibly. And this is the covalent linkage to the 3 prime end with the tyrosine. So we have accumulated over the years a, a fairly good number of crystal the, of drugs in the topo 1 DNA complex. They all have the same principle, which is that the drugs seen sideways, this is, these are the base pair that flank the cleavage site, whether it's the adenoisoquinoline, cantotessin, topotecan, they all stack in the same way. And if you turn all this 90 degrees, what you better appreciate is the coverage. It's a very beautiful pi pi stacking. So it's the aromatic rings come together, and the drug is like a perfect sandwich. That's why they stick so well into the cleavage site. And in addition to sticking to the DNA, the drugs have a network of hydrogen bonds that are very specific to topo 1. And that's a beauty that nature has evolved these drugs to uh, poison this enzyme in, by binding DNA, but also very specifically to the enzyme. And these aromatic, re these residues of the topo 1 that are outlined here in yellow uh, are all residues when they have a single point mutation make the enzyme totally resistant to the drug. So there are three hydrogen bonds. If you remove one hydrogen bond, the enzyme is resistant, the cell is resistant, you still get a crystal structure. So it means that the, the, the kinetics is the key in this system. And it's not a static structure. And the beauty of the system, when we got the crystal structure, was that the, uh, um, the question, camptotecin is, is a natural product, is produced by plants. And the question is, the plants have a topo 1, and the topo 1 of the plants is camptotecin sensitive. So the, 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 the question is, how do the plants survive? The, make it, they make the, 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 the toxin, yet they survive. So we all had assumed for a long time that it's because the, the camptotecin was made in the bark. And in truth, it's not true. It's also in the leaves. It's also in the flowers. And when the Japanese sequenced the topo 1 from the, uh, uh, the gene from the plants producing camptotecin, they found beautifully that all these plants have a single point mutation Asparagine 7222 serine, that was published in 208 in PNAS. And the beauty of it is that very same mutation is a mutation we had described seven years earlier in a human cell selected for resistance to camptotestin. So that tells us very clearly that there is a very specific targeting of this enzyme, because if you have a single point mutant, the plants can make the drug, and then the cells are totally resistant. It means the drug has only one target in the cell, which is topo 1. Uh, about uh, now over 10 years ago, we asked these questions. There were camptotestines, and it's relevant to you because these drugs are coming in the clinical pipeline. 
should there be any other TOPO1 inhibitors? Our answer is yes, So was yes at the time, and I think it's still yes. Uh, because TOPO1 is a validated target, we know it works, so there is no question about that. And because in, uh, in drug design or in drug history, even if you have two drugs that target the same macromolecule, the outcome in the clinic could be extremely different. And to me, a clear example of that is colchicine and venblastine. Colchicine and venblastine on the crystal structure look very much alike. Yet colchicine is used to treat gout, not cancer. And venblastine is used, is used to treat leukemia or lymphoma, not gout. So that was a rational. If you develop another drug, you're likely to have a different clinical profile. And the other reason is that as we were working with camptotecin, we realized quickly that camptotecin had major limitations. As much as I like these drugs, they have their own problems. And the problems are clear. For the patients, they are bone marrow toxic. They have intestinal toxicity for CPT-11 or inotecan. They are drug efflux substrates. And most of all, they are chemically unstable. And there is nothing you could do about that. First time I saw Monroe Wall, uh, that's the first thing we discussed, is this lactone ring opening. And the question whether this ring opening was actually key to the activity. And the answer is no. So this is the, this is the problem. And this is the interesting question. The uh, camptotecin, when you make it, you purify it, is in its lactone form. But the lactone is uh, alpha uh, hydroxylactone. And alpha hydroxylactone is chemically unstable. At physiological pH, within minutes, it opens and equilibrates to a carboxylate form. And it's reversible. But if it's physiological pH, it will be most of it will be this way. And if you have serum albumin in your system, this will bind serum albumin. So the equilibrium is shifted very quickly. And your active form gets depleted quickly. So clinically, that was a major problem, yet doesn't prevent the development and use of these drugs in the clinic. But it is a problem. The other problem, which is an advantage for lab uh, purpose, but not for the patients, is that the camptotecin bind reversibly. And because they bind reversibly, as soon as the, the drug is removed from the blood or from the medium, the cleavage complex is reversed. And therefore, they're very transient. So you need to give an infusion. And that, for the patient, was a problem. So we, we, our aim has been to actually discover drugs that would be like camptotecin, but would overcome some of these limitations. So we took advantage of the fact that the NCI, over the many, many years since the 80s, so now we're talking about 30 years, has accumulated in its portfolio a large number of chemicals, compounds, that have been tested against 60 cancer cell lines. And in the nine, late 90s, when I asked, the question that I asked is, there were about half a million compounds in the, in the collection. I said, please find me a drug that looks like camptotecin. So these are the 60 cell lines. And you could see the activity is mean-centered. So if a cell line is here, it means that it's an average sensitivity. If the cell line gives a response this way, it means that this cell line is particularly resistant and in the case of sensitive. So seen from far, this looks like a key. And the game was simple. Find the same key in the collection, but with a different chemical structure. And this was the first key we found out of the half a million. And it was NSC314622. So that was a bioinformatic analysis with Ken Paul. It took us about a week to dig out this compound. We had the chemical structure, so it looked fine. There is no alpha hydroxylactone, so we're very happy. And then the other good news is that the chemist who had made this molecule actually by, it was a byproduct. He was trying to make nitidine, and he didn't, that came up. And he put it in the NCI database and just forgot it, except we picked it up. And then I called Mark Cushman, and with Mark, we decided to embark and make, improve that molecule. And it took us about six or years to get from here, which is our initial compound, to three derivatives. Uh, which are labeled here. We made about 500. We're still making some today. Uh, and this was patented. And now these drugs are in clinical trial. These two drugs are in clinical trial in building 10. So they're in phase one clinical trial. Uh, the non camptotecin topo one inhibitors, so these are ours, the Purdue University NCI compounds. And this is another group from Genzyme and Sanofi Aventis, uh, which is also in phase one, two. 
So now in the clinical pipeline, there are non cantotestin uh, topo-1 inhibitors. And again, you could see there is no alpha hydroxylactone. Uh, these two compounds that are in, clin in clinical trial here, which we call now LMP776, we got away from the NSC numbers because, so we chucked the, all the beginning. And so it's called LMP776, LMP400. They are very potent, very specific. Uh, they overcome the limitation of the cantotestin, as I indicated, they are chemically stable. Uh, they overcome the resistance by drug efflux. So we collaborated with Susan Bates, my Gottesman, to show this. And they trap topo-1 cleavage complexes at different genomic sites compared to cantotestin. Therefore, we assume that the clinical activity will likely uh, be different, including pharmacokinetics more likely. Uh, to tell you uh, how we went to the clinical trial, because it's enlightening today that you cannot go into a clinical trial like that just because you have some activity. You have to have a biomarker. It's unlikely that anyone will want to develop any drug without knowing the target and without knowing what you should measure in the early phase of the development to make sure the drug is doing what you think. So we had to develop this biomarker, and we chose two biomarkers, one which is a chromatin modification marker for DNA damage, and the other one, the target topo-1 alone itself. So gamma H2AX was chosen because it's a very sensitive marker of DNA damage because it was discovered in our lab by William Bonner. So you, most of you probably have heard of gamma H2AX was discovered at the NCI by Bill Bonner uh, as a what he called very humbly a minor variant of H2A, it's H2AX. Uh, and then what we had to do is make sure this would work as a clinical biomarker. So to do this, we profiled gamma H2AX response in mice so before we went to man with topotican, a compound of reference, under what we call phase zero, meaning you measure a biomarker as you do your trial. And then we had to establish uh, whether it worked, when should we biopsy the patient after administration, and whether the dose was within a pharmacological range. So it's easy to list here, but actually this is a lot of work that was put in by the Dev Developmental Therapeutics Program at the NCI. So I'm very grateful that our directors agreed to do this. So this is an example of gamma H2X response in four different tumor biopsy of a melanoma xenograph in the untreated animal. Uh, in blue, you see the nuclei, and there are occasionally a few gamma H2X positive cells. In the treated mice, in these four xenographs, you could see now these little stars showing up, which are gamma H2X positive cell. Each little dot is a cell, is a nucleus, which has undergone a gamma H2X response. So that worked. And as we were doing this, we wanted to make sure this was happening under conditions where the mice would survive and where the drug would be active. So this is, this is an example of survival curves of these mice treat the uh, xenograft with the melanoma tumor. So the control mice, the tumor growth is like this. If you treat these mice uh, with topotican, so topotican is red and is squared. Um, at this concentration of topotican, you get some activity of topotican. At this concentration of topotican, you get a better activity, but the mice are barely viable. They have lost 20% of their weight. They're, they're very toxic uh, at this stage. And when we did the arandenoisoquinoline, this is the increasing concentration here, we were pleased to see that we could get a better response without so much toxicity. So the compound is active and the compound is much less toxic, uh, and that was good. And when we measured gamma H2X response, you could see as the tumor volume decreases, we get a better response. So we, we were happy to see that under pharmacological conditions, we were able to measure gamma H2AX. Next question was at what time should we biopsy the patients after treatment? It's a big question. You don't want to miss it. You can't biopsy patients several times. You have to biopsy one time after the injection. And in the murine model, it appeared that an optimum time would be four or seven hours after the one hour injection. So the mice would treat for one hour injected with the drug, and four hours would give a good response, and it was dose dependent. And this is maximum tolerated dose. So even at a tenth or a twentieth or a quarter of the maximum tolerated dose, we still had a good response. So that was encouraging, and that's the way the clinical trial uh, has been built. 
the second marker was topo one, which is the target itself. This also led to the development of a pharmacodynamic biomarker assay in collaboration uh, with Jim Dorshaw. And here again, as you treat at four hours after treatment with the adenoisoquinoline, the topo one level decreases. You can see as the cells, the cancer cells, are being targeted with the topo one inhibitor, the topo one gets degraded. That's what we refer as target engagement. It's a sort of military term. I'm not sure I'm totally happy with it, but that's a common term. The target is engaged, and target actually disappears. So that's a good sign. So now this is used in the patient. So in building 10, the patients who are treated have to agree to second biopsy. So the accrual is relatively slow, but then we measuring top one level and gamma H2AS. So these two drugs that are in clinical trials are potent. They are chemically stable. As I mentioned, their genomic uh, targeting is different from the camptotensin. The cleavage complexes, one other advantage compared to camptotensin, are much more persistent. So we can give one hour infusion, but the cleavage complexes last uh, several hours after we uh, the drug is gone from the blood. They overcome the drug efflux. They have anti-tumor activity. Uh, they are less toxic. I've shown you that. Gamma H2X can be used, and then this is ongoing now. So that's for topo one. Now I'll switch to topo two. If you wish to interrupt now and ask a few questions on topo one, I'll be happy to do so. But we are okay on time wise. So if you want, we can do that. Otherwise, I'll go on. How do you do in there? When they... Yeah, we'll just go on, right? Otherwise, when you do, do bidding, you know, you knock three times and then I go on. <laughs> so I go on. Topo 2, sorry, I need to take a deep breath because another complex. So I've, we've dealt with Topo 1. I've indicated, so just for now, just look at the left side just to get back on your feet. So Topo 1 uh, will take double-stranded double DNA, will relax it by making a nick and always re-ligating it and will be poisoned by camptotensin the adenoisoquinoline. That's fine. Link so three prime. Topo 2 is different. He will cleave both strands to do his transaction. It works as a homodimer. And the homodimer, so it's a homodimer of topo 2, alpha, topo 2, beta. They don't exchange. We, people have looked. The 2 alpha make homodimers 2 alpha, 2 beta with 2 beta. They cleave DNA with a four base pair stagger, the double strand break. Each monomer cleaves one strand, but the both bonomer I will show you stick together. It's a big machine. And that forms a gate into one strand, a double strand break. And that again goes on and off and re-ligates. So the topo then will cleave, if you wish, like this, but very quickly. And as I do this, it's, on phase, it's, on, it's not right, because topo 2 will never let go of the end. Actually, it's like my body. It will always hold the end. My hands are not going to fly away. Topo, you'll see, holds everything. It's a, it controls everything. Uh, and then the inhibitors of this are the etoposide, doxorubicin, or the quinolone free feeds bacterial topo 2. The differences are biochemical. So the polarity is different. Topo 2 links to the 5' prime end. It burns ATP. It needs ATP to be bound. It'll burn ATP for each catalytic cycle. It requires magnesium, doesn't work at zero degrees, and it's trapped by different drugs. The topo-1 inhibitors do not block topo-2. Topo-2 inhibitors do not block topo-1. They're highly specific. And the antibiotics, quinolone, do not block the host topo-2. And the anti-cancer drug do not block bacterial topo. So they're not antibiotic. Everything is quite specific. The two topo-2s, the tyrosine for this enzyme is in the middle. The topo-2-alpha and topo-2-beta are very similar. You could see the degree of identity and similarity. And functionally, you could think that topo-2-alpha or topo-2-A is an enzyme that deals with replicating cells. Topo-2-beta is an enzyme that deals with cells that are quiescent, such as neurons or immune cells that are non-dividing they then use topo 2 beta. Topo 2 alpha is very low. And you could see now that in bacteria, 
you have two genes for gyrase and two genes for topo4, but if you actually look the way the machines are built, they're very similar, except they're in two pieces. The domains are conserved, and they work somewhat similarly. There's a great deal of similarity. These enzymes to bind DNA use two metals. So it's a relatively complex machine uh, to sandwich between the DNA here and the acidic residues on the enzyme. So why this complexity? What's the trade-off? Let's look first at the relatively simple view of the system. The system is a topo 2 will deal with two duplexes. So if you have two duplexes, and you have, they are intertwined like this, what topo 2 will do, it will break one of my arms, make it go through, and then paste it back. It just will do that. And that's described here. So if you have two duplexes, one which we call the, the gate, because that's the one that's going to be broken, and the other one, which is the one transported, T, the enzyme binds as a homodimer and first engages uh, one strand and binds tightly to it, lets another strand come on the top, locks it in, and then opens the middle strand in the presence of magnesium after ATP is bound. Now what you have is sort of a donut cavity. So when the enzyme is cleaving that strand, it's holding everything. It doesn't let go of anything. So the strand is inside. And then once it's inside, it opens a second gate at the bottom. So it's a two-gate machine. And then it releases the, the strand that has passed through and burns ATP to regenerate in configuration. The end of the day, what you have done is exactly what I said. You have passed the strand. Why is that so important, so efficient? Is because when you have catenanes, which arise after replication, the only way to decatenate two things is to break one strand, pass it through, religate. So you could caten decatenate, you can catenate. Topo2 does that very well. By the same magic, it can unknot, it will remove knots, and it could eventually, and it does, relax supercoiling, which Topo1 does. So this is the only thing that Topo1 can do. Topo1 does not do this. Topo2 is absolutely essential for replication. Once you have replicated DNA and you need to separate the daughter molecule, you have to have a topo-2. It's an essential enzyme. And gyrase, which is the bacterial topo-2, has another function. It could actually generate negative supercoiling. So it has an additional function. So if you think of replication, when you have a, a piece of DNA which is supercoiled, during replication, there is a great deal of supercoiling that uh, will be generated. And there are two ways by which the supercoiling is being released or taken care of as DNA replicate. One is to wait for the very end of replication and decatenate at the very end. And that's what topo2 will do, is decatenate this at the very end of replication. And the other way is on the fly, is decatenate the region of single-stranded DNA. And that's what topo3 will do. And TOPO3 does that in conjunction with helicases, such as BLM bloom helicase or Werner helicase. And that's an alternative. So during replication, the TOPO2 and TOPO3 are very essential. And TOPO1 will not do this. TOPO1 will just relax supercoiling. The TOPO2 inhibitors is a large family. If you look at their chemical structure, the one thing you can probably find in common is this polycyclic ring. But they are very divergent in terms of structure, yet they are all very effective TOPO2 inhibitors. So here are the most specific, etoposide, uh, which is widely used in anti-cancer drug, or teniposide, much less used. Uh, this is the most specific, I say, because this etoposide is a pure TOPO2 inhibitor. If you go to doxorubicin, which is shown here, or mitoxanatrone, or amsacrine, or lipticinium, these are good TOPO2 inhibitors, but in addition to being TOPO2 inhibitors, they are DNA intercalators. And they also generate oxygen radical, ROS. So they are complex molecules, extremely efficient, but not only TOPO2 inhibitor. The only clean, simple TOPO2 inhibitor, I think, is etoposide. These are more complex molecules, yet they are very valuable. The antibiotics, 
uh, are all listed here. They're all the derivatives of nalidixic acids. So this was discovered at the NIH long ago by Marty Gellert. And there was actually a gene which was called the NAL gene before the gyrase was even totally understood when uh, Marty Gellert and Owen Nash were work and Mitsuhoshi were working on this. Uh, there was the NAL gene. And this is a chemical. And it's amazing that the chemical, this is not a natural product. It's such a specific poison of gyrase and then of topo 4. And over the years, there have been many generations where in the fourth generation of the quinolones, and some of them you recognize the names, such as ciprofloxacin, norfloxacin, or gemofloxacin. The next gen later generation are reserved for serious bacterial infection, and they're never given as first intention because they're just given for uh, antibiotic-resistant infection. The crystal structure of the topo 2 uh, has been resolved quite recently, actually, much uh, more recently than the topo 1, about two years ago. Beautiful crystal structure came out of Taiwan of the topo 2 with the drug. Uh, crystal structure of topo 2 without drug were found before by Jim Wong and, and, and Berger, but with drug was very recent. And you can see here the homodimer. So as I said, it looks very much like the little cartoon one monomer, another monomer, 170 kilodaltons, a huge machine. You see the hole or the strand that will go through. And then if you flip it, you just look at the top of it. This is where passing the gated strand, the, bring, the strand that's going to be broken, is nested on the top of the enzyme. And the drugs are exactly in the cleavage site. So it was very rewarding when the crystal structure came about because it was exactly what had been predicted long ago in 1990 when we actually proposed with Kurt Cohn the model of topo-2 poisoning by doxorubicin. So that, that now is brought true. The drugs bind at the interface of the DNA. You could see here the DNA base pairs. The drug is stacked inside the DNA base pair and make very specific hydrogen bond with the topo-2, which creates their selectivity. So the selectivity is born by the hydrogen bonding pattern with the enzyme, not by the intercalating moiety itself. And um, as this was going on, beautifully enough, the gyrase quinolone crystal structure came out about a couple of years ago as well from the UK. And this is gyrase. You could see now it's the, the, the tetramer, because you can see there. But it looks the same. You see that the hole, and you have the drugs. They are, look very much similar. And the four pieces of the enzyme, the drug, the, the base pairs, the drug, the hydrogen bond, same principle. And that led to this notion, which long ago we proposed now. The first publication we did was when I was in sabbatical. And uh, I met with Jacqueline Scherfis. Jacqueline was giving a lecture on Brefeldine and, and the ARF complex, the GTPA. And we realized I was giving a lecture on camptotestin. We realized together at the end of our lecture that we had something in common, is we were finding these natural products that were blocking these macromolecular machines by binding at their interface. And with Jacqueline, then we coined the term of, term of interfacial inhibitors, uh, published as the first paper. And more recently, we gave more example in this review. So the question is, how do these things kill cancer cell? Uh, that's still the big question we have to solve. And I'm not going to solve it here, because I don't have the answer. And the question is important, because when you give these drugs to patients, you would want to know who is going to really benefit? And today is very difficult to answer that question. But I think it's a question that needs to be asked. We should not dismiss the question. It's a probably potentially very fruitful question. It's not a simple one. But I think it's critical for patients and for biology. So the question is, should be based on tumor biology. I think it's no brainer today that uh, biopsying uh, cancers is, is an essential step before you give your treatment. And then uh, the, there are some simple answers. The uh, patients who should respond the best are the ones that have high topo 1 or high topo 2, because you need to have the target. Uh, more likely, we know from a model system that if cancer cells are DNA repair deficient or checkpoint deficient, they will be more sensitive than normal cells. And then there are some unbiased approach uh, that can be based on uh, cell line, database, and so on that are ongoing today. OK, I'll skip that. So something I would want to mention to you is what is going to come up, and probably in the years to come, is the critical nature of the repair pathways that are associated with topo-1 cleavage complexes. 
As I indicated in the case of topo 1, topo 1 gets a trap at the 3 prime end of DNA by making these covalent large adducts, and topo 2 at the 5 prime end. And there are specific enzymes that uh, can remove these topo 1 DNA or topo 2 DNA complexes. And these enzymes have been called, by the discovery of the topo 1 first, the TDPs, which stands for tyrosyl DNA phosphodiesterase. So if you go back to my third slide, uh, you could see that all the enzymes make a tyrosyl DNA bond, and what these repair enzymes do is to disjoin that. Uh, the first tyrosyl DNA phosphodiesterase, TDP1, was discovered here at the NIH by Howard Nash, and the second has been discovered a couple of years ago in the UK by Keith Caldecott. So there are two pathways to remove these adducts. One is to be very surgical, uh, is to remove exactly the tyrosyl bound adduct. The other one is to be a little more uh, uh, war surgery where you go for the amputation. So you just take away the piece of DNA as well. And there are a number of nucleases that have been identified that could actually chop that flap and remove a piece of DNA along with the topo. Because what needs to be done, and the reason the topo 1 inhibitors are toxic to cancer cell, is not because they make a cleavage complex. A cleavage complex by itself is not toxic. It becomes very toxic to the cell when it is encountered by a replication fork. When a replication fork collides, and the polarity is important here on 3 prime end, because the collision is such that the replication fork goes all the way and generates a double strand end. So we call this a re replication runoff. It's a double-stranded uh, replication uh, break, and this is very toxic. It could also be generated by transcription. And again, as I mentioned, now we know a number of predisposing factors that could sensitize cancer cell to a topo-1 inhibitor if they are deficient in XPFERCC1. This is fairly commonly altered in cancer. MOSED1, EME1, MR11, which is presumably altered in maybe 30% of colon cancer uh, that are familial colon cancer. Uh, so th this is possibly very important to understand because that may determine the response of the patient. And what we're learning more recently is the PARP inhibitors, which synergize with TOPO1 inhibitor, may be doing so because the PARP is working with TDP1. So if you do a PARP inhibitor uh, with a topo one inhibitor, the cells to uh, survive have to use this endonuclease pathway. And that explains the principle which is outlined here. So this was published now a couple years ago, is that if you, you have two pathways to repair topo one cleavage complexes at least. One is the TDP1 pathway, which is coupled with PARP, and the other one is the endonuclease pathway, such as XPFERCC1. So if you put a PARP inhibitor, you will disconnect this pathway. The cells will have to use this pathway. Therefore, a normal cell will have both pathways and will tolerate, OK, the presence of the PARP inhibitor because they could use this. But if the cancer is deficient for ERCC1, then it will be extremely sensitive because it doesn't have this pathway if you put a PARP inhibitor. So this has a testable implication, and hopefully clinical protocols could be developed based on this finding. So the repair of TDP2, to finish, I will just say that there is a TDP2. Much less is known. This is very recent now. The work on TDP2 inhibitors started only a couple years ago, and uh, the biology of TDP2 is, is to be fully understood. Yet, what we think is happening is that when a topo cleavage complex is formed, uh, targeted by anti-cancer drug, but also food product, flavonoids, for instance, or DNA damage, you get these cleavage complexes. And they are initially proteolized, and TDP2 can then remove the topo linked to the 5 prime end, and then this is repaired by, by non-homologous joining. So I would like to finish uh, this work. And um, because of the privilege to work at the NIH, uh, we have been extremely uh, fortunate that the NCI has chosen to help us to develop the adenoisocrine non capitotestin topo one inhibitor. Jim Doroshow is the uh, clinical director uh, 
for the NCI under Harold Varmus. He's also a lab member in our lab and a good collaborator. It's been a very privilege to work with him. Ken Paul discovered the NNOisoquinolines with me, thanks to the bioinformatic of the developmental therapeutic program of the NCI. And Mark Cushman is my long-term collaborator in the discovery of the NNOisoquinoline. Thank you. All right. Yeah, that was a, a something we really like to do. But um, what happens, actually, they're not synergistic. They're even antagonistic. Because what, what you do with a topo-1 inhibitor, you block replication. So the cells are blocked, not replicate. And then they don't and they become insensitive to topo-2 inhibitors. So they sort of counter. In principle, it's a good idea. In practice, it doesn't work very well. So. Sure. So the best, uh, most documented example is the doxorubicin. Probably no. So there was in Science or in Nature a couple of months ago a very, uh, a very incredible, I mean, very nice article in a way. But the problem with doxorubicin in children, you treat the leukemia. Um, and you look 20 years later, and some of the children really have, have had very strong side effects. And there was a picture of uh, two uh, of twins, uh, identical twins. One of them had had leukemia when she was very young, and the other one didn't. And you, there was a picture of these two identical twins. You couldn't tell they were identical anymore, because the toxicity had been pretty strong. So the difficulty on the doxorubicin is we do not know. I think it's about 10% of the children have this long-term cardiac toxicity when they get to be 20. And today, it's impossible to tell who is going to be on the bad side. Uh, so they are clear long-term side effect. There is also secondary leukemia that occur on the TOPO2 inhibitor, again, 5 to 10%. So these drugs are, obviously, you, you, know, you use them because you have to. And if you didn't, then it's 100% death. But reality is they are a little difficult. So that's the reason why people have wanted to develop TOPO2 alpha inhibitors because it's been argued that the cardiotoxicity is due to topo 2 beta. So if you made a topo 2 alpha specific, you may avoid the cardiac toxicity. So again, by understanding the mechanism of cardiac toxicity, you could probably design the drug better. The secondary leukemia, that's probably very, it's like any mutagenic thing, is, is a risk you take. So yeah, you had a question? So it's a differential. You're, you're always what you're, it's what we call the therapeutic index. And there is a therapeutic index. And uh, that's what we're trying to understand, is how the cancer cell actually are more susceptible than normal cell. So we're going in this DNA repair pathway. Cancer cells is like had many redundant pathways to deal with the prime. Cancer cell, they want to go fast. And often, they take away some pathways just to, because it's a gain for them as a cancerogenic process. They eliminate some of the repair pathways, but it's, it's an Achilles here. Uh, yeah, right. It's a very good question. Uh, people have started looking in lung cancer. There have been publications arguing that TDP1 actually is increased in lung cancer. Uh, we have started looking in a cell line model. Now, there are a large collection of cell lines, cancer cell lines. So the NCI is the NCI-60. Uh, the Broad Institute has the 1,000 cell lines, the CCLE. The Sanger Institute has another collection of 1,000. So we started looking. And they are indeed very different levels. And in the NCI-60, what was amazing, we actually found two cell lines out of 60 that are knockout. They are a natural knockout. Uh, they knock out TDP1. So, this may play a role, but it will take time before we capitalize on this. So yes, it's, it should be important to look. Thank you so much. Yeah, right.
Hi, Terry.